Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome you here at the Hamburg Institute for Social Research um, on the occasion of a wonderful event, uh, the talk by Ori Schwarz tonight about power in the digital age and I think a very important topic which we will listen to. But this event is an outcome of a conference on platform capitalism and its regulation and the conference itself which took place this morning and this afternoon and will take place tomorrow morning. This wonderful conference was based on a cooperation between the Max Planck Institute for International and Comparative International Law on the one side and the Hamburg Institute for Social Research on the other side. So it was a really delightful experience that these two institutions very, very closely located on the different ends of the street middle week what, what they did and how they cooperated, so we are really proud that it took place. But as always, uh, this kind of cooperation not only uh, depended on institutions, on anonymous structures, it always depended and depends on persons, on real beings, human beings as well. And here in this context, I would like to mention Matthias Grochowski, senior researcher at the Max Planck Institute, on the one side, and Friederike Baal, a member of the research group on the sociology of law at the Hamburg Institute for Social Research. Just let me mention two things. The topic of the conference, the relation of platform capitalism, fits quite well to the research agenda of the Hamburg Institute for Social Research. We have here in Hamburg at least two research groups which are dealing in some way with capitalism. The one on monetary sovereignty, which deals a lot with the problem of money in modern or postmodern societies. And the other one, uh, led by Tobias Eule, is the one on the sociology of law. And both research groups are working together. Both research groups are focusing on some aspects of capitalism, but this conference and this talk tonight is an outcome, a result of the work of the research group on the sociology of law. I'm really looking forward, uh, and I'm glad that I can over, hand over the microphone to Friederike Ball, who is responsible, together with Matthias Krokowski, for this wonderful event. Friederike Ball. Yes, thank you very much and also good evening ladies and gentlemen from me. I'm glad to welcome you all here today on behalf of the Hamburg Institute for Social Research and the Max Planck Institute for Comparative and International Private Law. And thank you all for this wonderful turnout this evening on this summary day. Um, but before we start, now it's time for the finishing touches to your hair because we are being live streamed today and uh, there will be a chance to view this talk afterwards on our his YouTube channel. So today, we would like to take a look at an ongoing transformation, and that is a digitalization of society. Some might argue that general processes of digitalization, such as the invention of telephone or personal computers, have started some decades ago. Yet, with the internet, things seems, seem to have changed. The first noticeable difference is speed. While it took the computer years to reach millions of users, some apps today reach this millionth user mark within days, uh, within a day, or even within an hour. But an acceleration in speed is not the only difference. With the internet, these processes might have also fundamentally changed in quality. Every day, we feed apps, devices, and platforms such as Instagram, Tinder, Google, or Amazon with information about our interests, purchases, habits, and friend lists. Where are we traveling for summer vacation? Which YouTube channels did we subscribe to? On whose Twitter messages did we like? And all of this includes information that for a long time would have, if not being held strictly private, then at least would have only reached a rather small, selected group of people. And now this information can not only reach audiences worldwide within a mouse click, this information is mostly given to private intermediaries who algorithmically document, track, and constantly reorganize and redirect 
our user data. And the way in which this algorithmic interaction is instated raises the question of power distribution. What is power in digital society? How does it work? And does it work differently than in an, in an analog world? And to find answers to these questions, I'm honored to welcome today Ori Schwarz to talk with us about theorizing power in digital society. And Ori Schwarz is a professor for sociology at the Bar Ilan University in Tel Aviv. And after receiving his PhD in sociology from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and spending a year as a Fulbright postdoctoral fellow at Harvard University, he joined the Department for, of Soci Sociology and Anthropology in 2013. And since 2019, he is also co-director of the Center for Cultural Sociology of the Bar Ilan University. And today we have the pleasure to discuss with him his wonderfully written book um, on sociological theory for digital society. I'm going to get it. And it was published in 2021 in Polity Press. In it, he explores the challenges digitalization poses to existing sociological theory and its core concepts, such as interactions, networks, or labor. And the title of his lecture, Theorizing Power in Digital Society, already gives away two key aspects that have been characterizing his work to this day and that I appreciate very much. And the first is, Ori is a defender of a general sociological theory. So rather than calling for the rise of a digital sociology as yet another subdisciplinary field, he argues that to understand the process of digitalization, we need nothing less than to revise classical sociological questions, questions that transcend any particular subdisciplinary division. What are the basic units of social life and social analysis? What motivates and shapes social action? What is agency? And what is power and how does it work? In answering these questions, Ori shows us that the introduction of digital technology and digital media does not simply offer just another slice of life or a new object for empirical research using the same old tools. The way that digital platforms and algorithms mediate and remold our ways of working, economic trading and public decision making it seems not far off to say that technologies change the face of society altogether. Therefore, digitalization calls less for a digital sociology than a general theory of digital society. And this applies to, for example, to the concept of power. What we can learn from Ori is that we should take the algorithmic nature of our daily interactions seriously. Because it not only shifts our focus of, on power, toward a privatized surveillance capitalism in the hands of a few companies, but it might also challenge one of the most influential aspects of the sociology of power, and that is the notion of legitimate power. Throughout the 20th century, the main question that haunted the sociology of power was, why are we still bounded when we are freer than ever? And very different authors, be it Max Weber, Michel Foucault, Pierre Bourdieu, or Heinrich Popitz, agreed that to answer this question, we must look at the understanding of those being dominated, how they voluntarily consent, or comply in blind obedience, or act out of fear. But what happens to this notion of free will when algorithms don't really rely on our compliance anymore because they pre-filter, block, and pre-organize without us necessarily being aware of that? With this refocusing of questions, there comes the second aspect that Ori offers us in his work. And that is that theory must be understood as a continuous practice of readjusting. While there might be something comforting in thinking about the theories that we come up with to describe the world as endlessly generalizable analytical frameworks that easily cross chronological boundaries, Theorizing is a continuous process of reevaluating, modifying, and reorganizing of concepts. Whether social scientists strive to capture capitalist dynamics, whether they try to describe the transformation of social protest, or to probe the communicative practices of digital life worlds. 
Every concept, be it power, resistance or social action, is an abstract limitation that probes the world through selective glasses. It already shapes our perspective. <clears throat> Accordingly, theories do not simply change in the face of a counter-argument. At best, they can be discarded. Theorizing therefore, theorizing therefore requires a willingness to revise the selectivity of our theoretical premises. Rather than being in search of any smallest common denominator, theorizing takes the form of a productive dispute that depends on our courage to come up with new hypotheses and maybe even more courage to let them go when they're no longer valid. And this is a task one cannot take on alone, and this is why I'm so happy to have him here with us today. Please welcome Uri Schwarz. Thank you. And thank you for this very generous presentation. <clears throat> so, social life under digitalization is governable than ever and is governed differently. Digitalization, the intertwining and mediation of digital technologies and sundry social and organizational practices, reorganizes power relation and concentrate much power in the hands of few flat platforms. Furthermore, digitalization transforms power itself and how it works. We need then not only produce critical knowledge of power in digital society, but also re-theorize power, rethink power sociologically. My talk today offers a preliminary outline of such a re-theorization. It's based on my new book, Sociological Theory for Digital Society, which more broadly adapts sociological theory and its core concept to the new socio-technical realities that challenge some of our core assumptions that we've taken for granted. But today, I'll focus on power and governance. Governability means susceptibility to institutional projects intended to shape action and interaction. My claim that digitalization turned social life more governable may sound surprising. How can governability be quantified and measured? I suggest this increased governability is not a quantitative but qualitative transformation in how power operates and how social life is governed, which has two reasons. First, uh, <clears throat> digital mediation itself and, the object and second, the objectification of interaction. The transformation addresses both power in the broad sense, the differential capacity to influence the course of events, and in the narrow sense of power over, the capacity to influence the conduct of others. I'll first discuss um, the governability introduced by digital mediation and why the rise of algorithmic power means we must re-theorize power, and then discuss the objectification of interaction and why rethinking interaction has implication for power in digital society. Finally, I'll discuss three features that explain the enormous power of platforms and their intensive engagement in governance, namely the control over new forms of social capital, the control over a new mechanism that binds the social together, and the reliance on workless labor. First, digital mediation itself. Action is more governable when it's digitally mediated since platforms that control the mediated algorithms can change our action, not through ad hoc decisions responding to them post factum, but through algorithmic rules that regulate them in advance. For example, last March, the Intercept website revealed an internal messaging app that Amazon de developed for its employers, where some works, words like unions, slavery, pay raise, or I hate, cannot be used. It's a story of an employer trying to regulate conversations among workers, not by setting a policy banning discussion topics, but rather by blocking certain messages. Amazon invented nothing new. Messaging apps and social network sites in China have long used similar blacklists for censorship. The users cannot even mention Winnie the Pooh for its alleged physically, physical similarity with President Xi. Messages with banned words are either blocked with senders getting error messages or are sent in a censored version without the senders even knowing. But China is no exception. And algorithmic governance goes way beyond online freedom of speech. All platforms and smart devices constantly exercise power over their users as part of their normal operation. 
<coughs> they enable users to take certain actions while rendering others impossible. Contents classified as spam, disinformation, porn, or copyright violation cannot be sent. Business transactions classified as suspected, suspected fraud are not executed. The motivation for intervention may be commercial, preventing conduct that may bother other users and make them lead, leave the platform. But this regulation of social interaction also has political meaning, which, by the way, may be progressive. On Tinder, men cannot address women that aren't already interested in them, and in Bumble, only women can initiate romantic interaction, turning the common gendered script on its head. Algorithmic power is so unique that it requires rethinking the sociological theorization of power. First, algorithmic power isn't mediated through consciousness. State laws depend on the cooperation of the government, who must know them in order to obey them. The power of bureaucratic rules relies on the consciousness of the agents of power, the bureaucrats, who must know and interpret them with some degree of freedom. Um, the rules and laws offer uh, people a model that they should know and follow. Algorithms are also rules, but unlike laws and bureaucratic rules, and also unlike disciplinary power, seduction, or persuasion, their power is not mediated through consciousness. Algorithms are rules that work, generate reality, even when nobody knows them. Indeed, then they work best, the most efficient, since without knowing them, it's harder to manipulate or circumvent them. As Shoshana Zubov suggested, when smart devices classifies use you classifies us as uh, terms of use violators and disable themselves, they represent a technological alternative to the contract, which, unlike contracts, renders the consent, consciousness, and cooperation of users redundant. Algorithmic power plays ever bigger a role in the governance of online platforms, regulating, regulating the flow of inter interaction and information in the operation of smart devices, cars, and apps, in decision-making of businesses and financial organization on loans, pricing, employees hiring, and management, and increasingly even in state policy decisions like whom to give welfare or, in some countries, whom to arrest as a security threat. The fact that a modality of power not mediated by consciousness significantly influences life chances means we must transform the agenda of the theorization of power because the theorization of power in the 20th century are organized around the problem of free will. Why are we bounded when we are freer than ever? Why reality fails to conform to the political ideal of equality? The generic answers offered by very different thinkers was basically because our consciousness is subjected to power, not autonomous and free. Marx's false consciousness, Gramsci's hegemony, Weber's legitimation, Bourdieu's symbolic violence, Luke's agenda-setting power, even Foucault's subjectification were all very different answer to the same problem. Social theory developed highly sophisticated constructs to understand manipulation on consciousness. Yet force, power that is not mediated by consciousness, did not enjoy similar theoretical attention. It wasn't denied, but it was viewed as trivial, obvious, not very important. After all, material force was viewed as constraining action, but not positively, positively shaping it, and as inefficient because of the resistance it usually arouses. All this has changed. Algorithms exercise material power, which is far from trivial, highly effective, faces little resistance, and is dramatically influencing our lives. Even more, ever more life aspects are subjected to algorithmic rules that both constrain and enable action in a way comparable to fusis, to the laws of nature, but it are at least partly human-made. We must then shift the focus of the theorization of power, adapting it to this shifting sociological, socio-technical reality. Algorithmic power is unique in its capacity to bypass consciousness through self-enforcing rules, Instead of banning porn, drunk driving, or financial fraud, machine learning systems try to identify and prevent them in advance. Scott Lash called it post-hegemonic power. This may go too far. As I'll show soon, conscious consciousness and legitimation still matter, for example, in resistance to algorithmic power. Yet the operation of algorithmic power is not mediated by consciousness. 
Focusing on how power subjects and constraints consciousness was helpful for the critical sociology of the 20th century, but to understand and analyze power in the 21st century, we should shift the focus of our agenda to material power, how it operates and how it can be resisted. resisted. The second big theoretical implication of algorithmic power is on the old debate on whether power exists before it's realized, whether we conceptualize power as potentiality or actuality. If you wish, uh, Weber versus Foucault. So Weber famously um, defined power as the differential probability to carry out one's will despite resistance. For Weber, this potential exists as a statistical probability that be even before it's realized. Weber was followed by most critical thinkers and sociologists, but opposed by thinkers like Foucault, Latour, Allen, and Hindes, who stressed that power is not a trivial realization of potentiality. Events are not predetermined by pre-existing power relations or distribution of resources. In their alternative conceptualization they offered, power is an effect, not a thing someone may have like biscuits. It's both immanent, existing only once realized, once resources are successfully mobilized um, in interaction, and, <coughs> sorry, in particular, it has qualities rather than quantity, not power as an abstract capacity in waiting to realize abstract wills before they even emerge, but powers in the plural. This isn't merely a scholastic debate, it has consequences for our work, because only if power exists as a potential can we ask who has power and explore power inequalities. So philosophical debates at this level of abstraction are rarely settled by empirical cases, but this may be one of these exceptions, because algorithms are what Lash called generative rules, that is, virtual potentialities that generate an infinity of actuals. The realization is certain, not a probability. Hence, they close the gap between power as potentiality and its realization, the distance that power must traverse. When rules are self-enforcing and cannot be violated, the uncertainty gap between potentiality and actuality disappears. When the exercise of power is both certain and potential, it's much harder to categorically oppose the notion of power as potentiality. The probabilities to carry out one will or to obey others could only be observed in their realized manifestation, not in their potential state, making it reasonable to claim that they did not exist before the realization. But this changes once power is independent of consciousness and probability, once it operates mechanistically. Foucault claimed that power exists only once put to action, but the power of algorithms is not situational, and I'll so sh soon show how it belongs to a post-situational order. Hence, it's not quite clear when it is put into action, when rules are automatically triggered, or rather, when they are first formulated. Unlike regulative rules like laws, their independence of consciousness means that algorithms are rules that always enforce themselves, and when a person or a group control them, they may generate or predetermine an infinity of actuals through the very action of setting or changing the rule. That's what I call generative ruling. So rulers have been, rules have been media of power and governance, at least this, since ancient Mesopotamian rulers, um, Ur, Namu, and Hammurabi, whose law codices listed prohibition and their pri tag prices. And we even call powerful people like these kings rulers. Yet algorithms and generative ruling transform the relations between power and rules, showing that code is not exactly low. All platforms engage in generative ruling, as the Amazon and the Chinese social media cases that open my talk show. With smart devices, generative ruling goes offline. Self-enforcing generative rules exercise even more power in div different devices and organization. Specifically, machine learning is used to predict the future based on big data analysis and prevent undesired futures, accidents, crime, terrorism, financial loss, in advance through complex sets of automatically designed generative rules. Here, what's delegated to algorithms is not realization of human decision, but decision making itself. Nation states start using this generative ruling as an alternative path to enforce their policies and laws, exploiting the increased governability introduced by algorithms. 
Just in November, US President Joe Biden signed the Infrastructure Mega Bill, which includes the Ride Act. According to this bill, within five years, every new motor vehicle will be equipped with advanced systems that prevent or limit motor vehicle operation when drivers are drunk or under substance influence. There are already systems that determine whether drivers are minor, drunk, impaired, rosy, distracted, or too tired to drive by monitoring driving performances, their position in lane, data from alcohol sensors, and camera use, used to monitor eye gaze or head position. Algorithms use this data to gauge the probability that a driver is drunk, and above a certain threshold, the system prevents starting, limits speed, switches autonomous driving, parks, or disconnects full fuel supply. Design of material objects is always enable and constrained design, but a uh, constrained action, but not through abstract and flexible if-then rules. So inventing pens that cannot write certain words or cars that cannot drive under certain circumstances used to be a huge engineering challenge. But once writing or driving depends not only on physical objects like ink, fuel, or battery, but also on algorithmic if-then rules, they are much more easily and flexibly conditioned and governed. The Ride Act demonstrates the rising involvement of private corporations in setting rules that govern different aspects of our life. The decision who may or may not drive is delegated to algorithmic rules set by private corporations. But here, private regulation is initiated by the state. Traditionally, states have governed through normative regulative rules defining who may do what, rather than technical rules defining who can do what. Now the state is not content with simply banning drunk driving, but seeks to self-enforce generative rules that cannot be violated, that bypass consciousness and necessarily produce infinity of actuals like the law of nature. This new strategy may indicate a double shift. First, a shift from regulation of social life through law to the regulation through algorithmic rules, which has started in the regulation of online platforms, but now extends to multiple other sides to social life in general, which means the study of and the critique of online platform may teach us something about our future more generally. And second, a shift toward privatization. The state delegates to private corporations, not only rule enforcement, but rule setting itself. The state determines the aim these rules should serve and set general standards, but the generative rules themselves remain trade secrets. Algorithmic rule doesn't necessarily require privatization, but privatizing legislation and government decision is much easier when it takes the form of product purchase. And we find the same disturbing pattern elsewhere. For example, when judges use software that predict recidivism based on privately owned secret models to make judicial sentencing and parole decisions. Importantly, these judges, like drivers who use Google Map or Waze, get algorithmic recommendations, not generative rules that translate into reality while bypassing the consciousness. They may ignore these recommendations, but recommendations are hard to resist because they are given as mere bottom lines without reasoning and explanation. They have an aura of objectivity. However, even generative rules that are realized independently of our consciousness still open path for resistance. How can algorithmic power be resisted? Through the tools. The more people are governed by hidden algorithmic rules, the more they produce lay knowledge, more or less accurate, of these algorithms, reverse engineer them or reconstruct them in order to manipulate or circumvent them. The tools violate the spirit of rules, but not their letter. For example, sending the banned word as a picture rather than a text, or using a synonym. The tools rely on creativity and agency. Consciousness remains just as important in resisting power even when it's not mediated through consciousness. Since algorithmic rules don't leave any space for human interpretation, they are very susceptible to resistance through the tours. And this is one of the reasons why they are kept secret and unstable, contrary to our shared notion of justice, expecting legitimate rules to be standing and promulgated, as John Locke famously put it. Resistance through the tools bears more similarity to solving engineering problems than to political resistance to human rules. And this is no coincidence. Algorithmic rules are um, indeed nomos, political, uh, artificial, social rules that 
but they operate like physics, like the laws of nature, and blur this all distinction. They cannot be violated, but can be by bypassed. Rethinking power also means then rethinking resistance. Some algorithms make collective resistance especially challenging because they take into consideration so many variables that they treat every person differently as a unique individual, not a class member. Hence, they avoid the leveling of the governed described by Weber and promote what Andreas Reckwitz called singularization. This is a fascinating paradox of algorithmic power. While it never deviates from the rules, like the ideal typical bureaucrat, um, <coughs> being governed by equal rules no longer makes you anybody's equal. The relations between power and categorization also transform, making collective resistance harder. Importantly, the fact that generative rules cannot be violated doesn't guarantee they'll achieve their intended wider social goals. For example, theoretically, censorship may eventually weaken the Chinese regime and increase resistance. Generative rule is not omnipotent. It eliminates uncertainty about the possibility of action it technically blocks, not about its wider governance project. However, defining power in terms of the realization of project is necessarily self-contradictory and subjectivist because realizing why one's ends in view, what we want to achieve now, often thwarts one's long-term projects. So we must recognize there is certainty about the exercise of power while shaping the course of events here and now in a certain way. Finally, the gap between potentiality and actuality closes when power is exercised automatically whenever triggered conditions are, fu are fulfilled, power becomes also post-situational. It's no longer exercised within a situation in a certain time and place, and depending on how it evolves. And hence, the situation loses its privileged position as the locus of power. When rules automatically translate into reality, the moment of realization is much less important. This also makes it harder to resist power. The situation in which power is exercised is the obvious place for resistance, but this moment fades away. Phenomenologically, we don't experience most algorithmic decision as events. The exercise of power becomes nearly invisible. Hidden rules are set and changed, and we only meet their consequences. The information algorithms chose to show us and the material opportunities that they open to us. Tracing back algorithmic decisions to human agency that we can hold accountable is similarly difficult. In the book, I show that more generally, we move into a post-situational order. Situations are no longer the basic building blocks of social life, since interaction is mediated and objectified. This is the second reason digitalization introduces increased governability. The first one was that social life is increasingly subjected to generative rules as platforms and smart devices determine what can and can't be done in ever more spheres, regulating relations between potential spouses, consumers and sellers and service providers, taxi drivers and passengers, tourists and hosts, teachers and students, political activists, family and friends. But digital social life is more governable not only when it's subjected to algorithmic governance, that prevents undesired contact, but also when it's governed in more traditional ways, like retrospective punishment for rule violations. This is because in digital society, action and interaction are self-documenting. Digital activity leaves behind logs, our cellular location history, credit card purchases, um, websites that we visited, the files that we opened, are all documented as database entries. This datafication gained much attention, and it obviously increases knowability, governability, and surveillance. But digital interaction also is also self-documented in another and more overt sense. Whenever more mundane interactions move to platforms like social network sites and instant messaging, they are automatically objectified as durable objects. Posts, likes, messages, videos, audio recordings. This transformation, which I call the interaction object duality, is a real revolution. Interactions in objects used to be completely different things. Interactions used to be flow of performances, actions and counteractions that exist only while going out of existence, remaining only in our subjective memory, not objectively. 
digital mediation turned interaction into the collective production of durable data objects, which are made of binary code and hence can be easily copied and distributed, thus changing the dynamics and temporality of interactions, and importantly for us, changing power relations. The objectification of interaction transforms power relations in two ways. First, it increases governability and is at least partly responsible for platforms' intensive engagement in governance. When every action or statement keeps existing as an object, they produce evidence that can be easily interpreted as rule violation that should be punished. When Facebook allows users to report rule violation, it soon faced more than a million complaints a day as users translate personal and political disputes into quasi-legal ones, demanding that Facebook looks closely into the objectifying mundane conduct of their interaction partners. When interaction keeps existing in this objectified form, it's also much easier to criticize platforms for failure to enforce rules. Secondly, objectification means power relations are less bounded within situation, as interactions <coughs> as interaction objects may be exposed to ever new audiences to which parties may be held accountable. Objectification means we must rethink interactions since our interactions turn into objects and then they are no longer situated, no longer bounded in time, place, and the number and identity of participants. And this is consequential. Symbolic interactionism, one of the main traditions in sociology, assumed that interaction Interactions are situated, taking place within a known set of actors who monitor one another. And hence, they can negotiate the definition of situation and the roles within it. Situatedness allowed negotiation within interaction to create new realities, rather than simply mirror the wider patterns and the wider power relations in society. Um, but interaction is no longer situated when it takes place in instant messages that can be forwarded to third parties when popular apps automatically record all phone calls, and especially when interaction takes place in social network sites where algorithms determine, based on network maps and post-engagement measures, to whom it should be presented, recalculating the set of interaction participants each, each moment anew. And the interaction, as it evolves, sometimes, you know, unpredictably change, the set unpredictably change from a few friends to thousands of strangers. This is extremely different from uh, the stable situation bounded within walls that characterized what Goffman called the world in society. As long as the social world was organized as a set of bounded interactions with people moving from one situation to the other, negotiation over the meaning of interaction took place within situations. And hence, although situation was never truly bracketed from external power relations, neither did it simply reflect them. It had a degree of autonomy that interactionists pointed out. In digital society, meaning and identities are still negotiated in interaction, but the latter is no longer situated. This poses practical challenges to actors who can't predict their audiences and adapt their conduct, and it poses theoretical and methodological challenges to interactionism, which I discussed in the book. But what's important for us is that breaking the situation boundaries redefine power relation. This is evident in employment, as most employers today search for objectified leisure time interaction of jo job candidates or when employees are fired for political Facebook conversations among friends, which especially hurts minorities. In other cases, like shaming of sexual harassers, it is the weaker interaction party who gains power by breaking the interaction boundaries. Um, and this also transforms the phenomenology of power in interaction. A good example is a large Facebook groups where women shared print screens of online sexual harassment. Knowing in real time that they will share their harassment with the group results in women only apparently interacting with their harassers while actually talking to the group community over his head, laughing at his expense, empowered by the virtual presence of the community. And more generally, the objectification of interaction introduces increased accountability. 
Some of you might have noted during my talk that um, <clears throat> this node was not sent along with the sentence I just said to all your acquaintances and families who might not have approved of what I said. And this is exactly what happens with Facebook likes. <clears throat> So uh, it trivially uh, makes us much more accountable to unpredictable audiences. This results in a constant tension between the interaction's internal pressures, aims, and needs in the present, like communicating, coordinating action, building solidarity, and pressures introduced by the future trajectory of the objectified interaction, as every action, gesture, or statement may join one's exhibition of self, the data object that present us to diverse, algorithmically recalculated and has unpredictable future audiences. The shift into a post-situational world, not organized as a sequence of bounded situations, indeed, we often participate in multiple unbounded interactions simultaneously, transforms power relations between actors and also grants platforms great power, as situatedness is conditioned upon their code and interface design, which they may always change. So long I discussed power generally, but since this talk is part of a workshop on platform capitalism, I'll focus on three features of social media platforms that grant them enormous power and encourage them to engage in governance. Their control over social capital, their capacity, sorry. Their cap <coughs> Yes, sorry. Um, their control over social capital, their uh, capacity to offer a new glue for social life, and their reliance on workless labor. We shouldn't forget that platforms exercise power not only through generative rules. For example, large part of content moderating still conducted by humans with decisions that regulate social relations. Users have little say about how they are governed because platforms are for-profit commercial enterprises and because state laws allow them to regulate social relations between users to maximize profit while disregarding democratic values and the wider interests of their users. As a growing part of the political and social interaction is mediated by digital platforms, this is a problem. And a 40-year-old critique of the merchant sovereignty of mass private properties like malls that replace the public town squares and subject, um, <coughs> sorry, <laughs> and subject civil or mass private property, uh, uh, civil rights to commercial considerations is more relevant than ever. Social network sites and other digital platforms take this move to the next level. They make decisions on core political rights like the freedoms of association and speech and their limits determine what people may and can do, say, or sell, which association will be dissolved and which protests will be tolerated. When big platforms turn into monopolies and when avoiding them involves significant cost, even reducing employability, the political claim that users should be democratically co-determining the platform rules that govern them may be obvious, but as a sociologist, I wish not only to point at this uh, democratic deficit and the critique of the private ownership and identify the mechanism that explain why social media platforms wield so much power and why they are so much interested in governance. These mechanisms rely on such technical transformation in digital society to have theoretical implication, and the first of which is the objectification of social, of social capital. Right. So social capital is a sociological concept pointing to the fact that social ties are resources. They grant people some access to resources of other people that they know. So tie structure and inform inequality. Social network sites dramatically stream streamline the use of social capital. With little effort, users can keep in touch with many ties, gather attention, and thus increase the chance of recruiting them to their projects, whether it's finding a new job, getting helpful information, selling a product or service, making them join a neighborhood initiative or political protest that they organize, etc. Instead of addressing ties one by one, they may write a single post and 
share it with an algorithmically determined subsection of their followers. So followers turns into an objectified form of social capital. By streamlining social capital mobilization, objectification has also increased the relative importance of social capital. Diverse actors across, rule, across fields, brands, social movements, politicians, artists, even academics, invest effort in creating emotionally engaging content in order to translate the ephemeral emotions that they produce into durable, durable digitally registered following ties that grant them future access to users' attention, and thus they increase the number of people whose resources they can mobilize or could potentially mobilize. So Bourdieu suggested that fields like literature, music, politics are organized around unique forms of capital, around tokens of status or recognition or um, symbolic uh, power to shape field hierarchy, which are unique to the field. Other forms of capital, like money, are not field specific. They are general. And when social capital is objectified on social networks, it turns into such a general form of capital that remolds all fields. This transforms what social capital practically is. It turns from a symbolic form of capital lying in our sense of obligation and reciprocity into a material form of capital lying in databases of internet corporation. For the first time, social capital can be centrally regulated, devalued, or confiscated by platforms. It becomes abstract. Qualitatively different concrete ties turn into a number of our followers. Simply put, it becomes very much like money. So social media platforms are like banks where multiple individuals and organizations deposit their social capital to maintain it from decay and even increase it. But platforms then control this capital, and which gives them much power. They may decide for which goals this social capital can be mobilized. For example, in 2011, Facebook allowed using it to topple Husni Mubarak's dictatorship in Egypt, but not to topple Israeli occupation in Palestinian West Bank. They can also confiscate social capital that users have gained through hard work over years by closing down accounts. And this threat is often enough to make users very docile. So platforms' power relies partly on their control over digital mediation and generative ruling, and partly on their control over objectified social capital. But there's more. Platforms also have power since they offer a new glue for social life, a new answer for the very basic, fundamental question, what binds people into something bigger that can't be understood at the level of individuals? What binds the action, consciousness, and mental states of different people into wider moves or phenomena? So Randall Collins, building on Duokheim, suggested that solidarity emerges when different people focus their attention on the same object at the same time, and then they start feeling solidarity with one another. They develop feeling for one another. And social media platforms make a very similar thing. They um, allocate users' attention and focus the attention of different users on the same objects at the same time with similar effects. This is the main path through which platforms influence culture in general and contentious politics in particular. After all, collectives are more powerful than their parts. Yet, what they produce is not exactly stable collectives. To understand what it is, we must look closer at the operation of social network sites. These platforms allocate attention based on maps of ties, both formal following ties and interaction patterns that are constantly monitored and analyzed to calculate the strength of each tie. The assumption that these ties have predictive power is borrowed from the sociological branch of social network analysis. So websites like Facebook are often viewed as simply uncovering a social network structure that predated them, but they aren't. Unlike the tie maps that were drawn by sociologists, these digital maps are ontological rather than epistemological. They aren't metaphorical networks, models of repre or representation of the society, but they are concrete networks, key components in algorithmic governance dispositives that govern society 
regulating flows of interaction and information and attempts of actors to recruit one another to projects and shaping knowledge and power relations based on digital maps of ties. These objectified networked networks transform the social relations that, represent, that they represent. And this effect is not mediated by the consciousness of the actors, but by back-end algorithms. What this process produces is quasi-collectives that are social power, that have social power, as demonstrated by public protest organized on social media, but unlike collectives, they aren't stable, constantly recalculated, with no binary membership, where you're either in or out. And I wish to call them connectives, following the use of this term by social movement scholars Bennett and Sagerberg and memory scholar uh, Andrew Hoskins. So social movement scholars identified a new type of protest that organizes online without formal organization, um, clear collective identity or leadership or shared demands, and instead they have vague messages um, disseminated mimetically when every user changes and personalizes it a bit, and they resemble collective action, but practically without the collective. So they call it connective action. Like brush fires, these protests are quick to flare, intense, and quick to fade. And at the same time, memory scholars show that memory also takes a new form in digital society, that we increasingly recall our personal past through documentation created by other people around us, and recall our collective past through network memory of co-citizens. So this connective memory is neither private, it's created by multiple individuals and accessible to them, but nor is it collective. It doesn't belong to any bounded collectivity. No two people have access to the same networked memory. Understanding this change requires rethinking social networks. So sociologically, uh, we usually use the word social network as a metaphor, either for structures of ties generally or for the unique structure of late modern society, the so-called networked society, which no longer consists of monolithic collectives. Contrarywise, the transformation I described in social movements and memory actually relies on networks that are not metaphorical. They are concrete. They are instantiation of a new form of human association in which what binds together the attention and the actions of different people are digital maps of ties. These connective associations are only possible since social networks transform from sociological representations of society into performative data objects that change and govern it. Just like interaction and social capital, social networks are objectified and become performative. They do things, allocate attention, and bind different people, actions, and emotion together. The flexibility and instability of, connective, of connectives has a material dimension then. The audiences created by social network algorithms are less stable than those created by walls or by modern political organizations. They aggregate people differently, and when they bind people and human actions together, the glue of the social is not only shared collective representation, this of course also play a key role, but also performative objectified network maps. How people are bound together is crucial for understanding social organization and power. When technologies of collective solidarity like state TV or town squares are replaced by connective technologies like Facebook that bind together individuals and their actions without forming stable groups, the paths for political and social change transform. So one example is the weakening of social movement organization that have been used to pool resources um, which were necessary for political struggles. And they were uh, a <clears throat> so-called um, necessary point of passage, but they are no longer an obligatory point of passage. And what is are new organizations that become more important platforms. <clears throat> so these platforms practically control this new glue of social life. So rethinking the notion of social networks reveals a new social ontology, if you wish, and a new source of platform power. My very last argument for tonight is that 
Platforms are pushed to engage in extensive governance over social life since they are based on a unique economic model of workless labor. Firms have long used to govern their employees to increase profit, that's what's called management, but they weren't particularly interested in governing our social relations with friends, family members, political or sexual subjects. All this changes since the objectification of interaction across life spheres means interactions become productive. It produces data objects that may be owned by corporations, platforms operators, and have economic value for them. When conversations with friends over social media are objectified, they may be interesting enough to make others spend time on platforms and watch ads. When users push the like button, they don't only tell other people what they think, they also give information to about the preferences to corporations. Um, <clears throat> when, um, when we let apps and smart devices follow our location, actions, and ties, and constantly analyze our life and attention, all our actions become productive, and they produce real objects, database entries with exchange value. When our actions on platforms are and beyond are documented and objectified, they can be analyzed to identify pa patterns and to produce profitable predictions that are used to identify business risks and opportunities and to personalize advertising as services. We produce valuable goods without experiencing these actions as work. Platform capitalism relies then on a new form of labor. It extracts what I call workless labor, following Engels' distinction between work and labor. Work is typically defined as purposeful human activity involving exertion that is not undertaken solely for pleasure, but has value. So it's a phenomenological category. It involves consciousness, strain, purpose, instrumentality, experiences that used to distinguish the work sphere from the leisure sphere. Contrarywise, labor is an analytical category of social critique, denoting the activities that produce exchange value and not only use value. Engels and many others viewed labor as Special case, subcategory of work. So strenuous works existed long before capitalism. Abstract, exploited, alienated work did not labor. Yet the latter is still work because producing exchange value was believed to require consciousness, instrumentality, purpose, strain. Digital platform economy teaches us that this affinity between work and labor was historically contingent. The digitally mediated activities I just mentioned fall within the definition of labor but they are not work. They often lack consciousness of the productivity, instrumentality, or strain, and often belong to leisure sphere. Even pure leisure activities like dancing, being silly, playing video games, may be very productive labor when documented in videos posted on YouTube or TikTok and watched by millions. So this may transform power relations between capitalists and laborers. Shoshana Zoboff suggested that Platforms that analyze our objectified action and interaction are indifferent to what we do. They keep profiting anyway, no matter what we do. Hence, they aren't dependent on our cooperation as user laborers. Unlike factory owners, we're very much dependent on the actions of labor. But this is true only up to a limit. Platforms aren't fully indifferent to what we, what we do. Users can be more or less productive and even engage in sabotage. Platforms are bothered by users with multiple accounts, those who resist tracking, those behaving in ways that make others leave the platforms. Um, and this is why platforms engage in intensive governance. While management is nothing new, digital corporations are unique in exploiting the workless labor of billions of users. And once our social, romantic, family, playful, and political interactions become labor, a source of profit, platforms have an interest in governing nearly all our life aspects to maximize profits, and they can do so as they mediate social life. Platforms face unprecedented volume of governance work due to the combined effect of their economic interest in biopolitical governance over user population to maximize profit and the objectification of, inter of interaction which introduces increased governability, accountability, and demand from states, from individuals, from organizations, that platforms should govern, that they should govern the interaction that they mediate. And consequently, 
They develop complex governance dispositive that combine generative rules that play an increasingly larger role, traditional regulative rules, peer policing by users who report one another for violating the latter, and proletarianized judgment by badly paid content moderators, sometimes from third world countries. Moderators must make decisions within seconds without giving reasonings and without hearing argument or learning about the context based only on the contested objectified interaction alone in order to keep to minimum the cost of dealing with this unprecedented volume of quasi-judicial labor. Making judicial decisions, historically the work of rulers and later high status professional turned into a dirty job, which is constantly in tension with our sense of justice, which was designed in an utterly different social technical environment when judgment was small scale and high cost, intensive rather than extensive. So I'll conclude. My talk discussed several social changes in digital society, the rise of generative ruling through self-enforcing rules, the objectification of interaction networks and social capital, the shifts toward post-situational sociality, the rise of connectivity in which time apps and algorithms allow platforms to offer new mechanisms that bind the social together, and the productivization of leisure in interaction as workless labor. These transformations have far-reaching implications on social life and social theory in general. Today, are only focused on their implications on power relations between individuals, for example, on the capacity of individuals to bracket power relations within interaction, within situations, and on the extreme concentration of power in the hands of few platforms. I show how this transformation increased the governability of social life and the demand for governance, and I also discussed the uniqueness of algorithmic power, how it redefines what ruling means and the relation between power and rules and how it can be resisted. Finally, I called for a new agenda for the sociology of power in the 21st century, one which takes into account both the material dimension of power and its intertwining in new forms of capitalism in order to shift critical social research from the challenges of the former century to those of our own. Because when power transforms, our knowledge and critique must follow. Thank you. Thank you very much, Oli, for this inspiring and wonderful talk. Uh, maybe before we kind of open up the discussion, let me ask you maybe two questions. <coughs> because when I read your book and the way we monetize our digital relationships, like you just mentioned, we collect followers, subscribers, and friends as potential capital, and platform companies profit from our workless labor, I was reminded of a phrase that is often assigned to Benjamin Franklin. Remember that time is money, he wrote um, in his 1748 essay called Advice to a Young Tradesman. And in this text, he's out to remind his youthful readers of the opportunity cost of laziness. And when you're not working, he says, you're really just you know, throwing potential earnings away. And I was wondering, when I listened to you and I read your book, if we need to rephrase that for digital society, so we're not talking about time is money, but more like ties are money. Because facilitating relationships is like a currency, it actually pays off. So would you kind of sign off on this? Well, first, I completely agree uh, in, to what you hinted, namely that we can see this shift I just described as another chain, and, and, and another, uh, part in, in a long chain of rationalization. And indeed, this rationalization in this case is not about time, but about activity in general, about sociality more particularly. So yes, um, social ties are experienced instru instrumentally and are accumulated. In a sense, we all always did this, but the objectification transformed the way we experience it. So it, it transformed the way we subjectively relate to it. Because 
we experience it as, as a project of accumulation and it, 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 it transforms social relations to, to a high degree. Yeah. Not, by the way, not only among ind individuals in, in pure sociality, but it's it, it also there. But I think it's more interesting in other contexts, for example, when we look at <coughs> the way um, activists think about what activism is. And I, I had a, um, a master student who uh, interviewed activists, and for them, activism was producing content because if you don't produce content, you don't get followers, and no, then nobody takes you seriously, and then you can mobilize people to act. So basically what they did was producing content, and that's what the way they imagined social change. So it transformed different fields in different ways, but ways that are share a lot with one another. Yes, thanks. Um, maybe to dive a little bit deeper into the, the concept of power. In your take on power, you challenge one of the key concepts of the sociological, sociological theory of power, and that is the notion of legitimate power that needs the consent of those who are dominated. And you basically argue that we should move away from the problem of free will and that contemporary power operates independently of people's consciousness. And I was wondering, what does this mean for our understanding of the concept of agency? And not really, you know, in the sense of a human resisting, but also maybe in the sense of an, a an enabling agency. And um, does this change, does it have it to be a human agency, or would you even go the f that far to say we need to rethink agency in a more material sense that also includes algorithmic practices? Okay, so two comments on this. First, on legitimation. I do not suggest that legitimation is not important. I do suggest that the assumption of Weber that power which is not legitimate is extremely inefficient is not always true. That in different social material context, this is true to different levels. But I'm very, I would be very, um, uh, we're not to, to claim that le legitimacy doesn't play a role because legitimacy is, is crucial to understand resistance. This is the first thing. And second, thinking about agency in terms of the isolated individual, the liberal cogito, <laughs> which awakes one day and has agency, is maybe related to the way it's a myth of liberal society, so it, it reverberates very well among all of us, but it's very different from most theorizations of agency in contemporary sociology. So what I just described is a caricature, of course. And in this sense, you don't need me to claim that agency is not this thing, that agency is always a, a collective a, a achievement that is also always have a material dimension. And of course, what, what I presented uh, strengthened this, this position, but I don't think you, you need me to, to say it. I, I think it's very much uh, shared knowledge. Thanks. So I'm going to open up the floor and uh, for questions and comments. And you can also write online, and I'm going to keep an eye on the chat. So feel free. Yes, there's going to be a microphone handed to you. Um, okay, uh, thank you very much for your uh, really inspiring talk. I would like um, to challenge you a little bit in your, in your definition of uh, algorithmic power and governance. Where does it start and where does it, uh, does it end? Uh, you, you, you mentioned, you give some very um, um, uh, convincing examples, but uh, let me give you a counter example and I'm going to ask you if, if, if this is uh, already falls into this category. Um, um, if I replace a, a, a door, a, a key with which I can open the door manually, analogically by a, a, a key code, for example, um, um, a digital key, so to say, uh, which uh, algorithmically 
com compares the numbers I enter with the, um, with the stored numbers. Is that already an, an example of uh, algorithmic governance and power exerted on me? Or would you, um, would you exclude that? And, and could you please elaborate a little bit more of when, when it really, um, this really applies, this powerful concept? Thank you. So, as I said, material design has always enabled and constrained action. And you don't need digitalization to do this. But you had to solve each problem in you. Because um, you, know, you have to develop a solution to each governance project. And it was an engineering challenge. What transforms is the potential to change reality by simply changing an if-then rule. So your capacity to generate multiple futures, multiple realities very easily, this uh, flexibility of governance is what's new. I, I hope it answered your question. Yeah. So it's more the <coughs> automatization uh, of, um, of a principle which um, before had to be done by hand. Sorry for... It's more than this. It's the potential to create an uh, infinity of futures by simply changing the rules. It's the transformation of the relations between abstract rules and concrete realities. And well, um, physical objects, unlike digital objects, um, often enable and constrain a very limited number of futures uh, uses, um, this number becomes unlimited in a sense. So, I understand. Thank you. Yeah. So it, 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 it's, a, it's not about where it's at. It, it, it's not quantitative. It's qualitative change that I want to point at. And it's qualitative change that relates to, I, I think, the, the, this question of potentiality is at the core of how we conceptualize what power is, where we can really think about someone having a potential to change the curse of events, which, which is, if you think about it, it sounds very unreasonable, although we use this notion all the time, because how can I know before it happened? And I think knowing that you can know is a very big difference. There's a question from Tanzaski. Hi, thank you. So I have uh, two questions. I guess you addressed them in the book. The first is a follow-up. I was wondering if you could give us a definition of algorithm because throughout your presentation I saw you went in a few directions. And second, regarding power, I'm not well-versed in the literature here, but I was wondering if the movement to the digitation, are you saying that there's overall more power or is always power a zero-sum game? And if so, um, how is the power now distributed? My sense is that you're saying that the algorithm operators have more power than they had before, but also in the end you spoke about like TikTok and uh, person uh, influ online influencers, and now my sense is that you're saying that in some instances the uh, technological infrastructure allows them to capitalize on the power that they have more effect. So, to start with the second question, I suggest that digitalization transforms both power relations between users and the power relation between users and platforms. Um, it, <coughs> so, <coughs> of course, it, it um, creates a kind of game and define the rules of the game. In this game, you have winners and losers. But by being able to shift the rules of the game and by being able to, um, <coughs> for example, to, to confiscate the um, social capital accumulated on the platforms or to devalue it, to say, no, today, if you have 
10,000 followers, only 100 of them will see your post if you don't pay me. So being able to do so, to close the, the account, allows them to, um, <clears throat> to control these power relations, to, to regulate these social games in a sense. So they're, they're not players, they are regulated. They have different status in the this, in this system. And <clears throat> remind me what, what it was? So, no, it, I smile because they are the very um, familiar um, definition of, of uh, algorithms as recipe or a set of, uh, of rules, uh, of abstract rules. And of course it's helpful, but, and here I say nothing original, uh, in, in the social sciences, when we talk about algorithms, we do it um, more liberally in the sense that we talk, when we say algorithms, we actually use algorithmic dispositives. We actually use al al systems based on algorithms. So I could have been more accurate by talking more time, which I avoided. And it's correct that you pointed at this point. Kate, this is this was tremendous. Thank you so much for this. I just ordered the book, um, and I'm excited to. Uh, sorry, I mean, I just, I mean, I have not like I don't, you know, this has just been wonderful. Um, but uh, and I'm looking forward to reading everything you have to say. Um, but a lot of what you were talking about today seemed incredibly valuable in the descriptive work that you've done in this space and how you have explained and increased the level of abstraction about all of these notions and so that we can have a more productive conversation about them. Um, so thank you. But I'm curious if you have normative takeaways, well, normative takeaways from all of this. Like what, I mean, and I'm always the one getting this question, so I'm giving it back to you. <laughs> Just take a big swallow for the big <laughs> question. I think my normative position was very clear. I, and, and, and I can state it even more clearly. I wanted to, uh, to discuss mechanisms because I think it's very easy to take the position of the, uh, of, you know, critique that only points at what's wrong and on, on, it's only normative without actually understanding how we got to where we got to. But uh, normatively, I think that, uh, that equality is important, that power, uh, that extreme power inequalities and asymmetries are a problem, that the concentration of power that reflects on social and political life is dangerous and that uses, if the medium of the media in plural of our social life are algorithmic platforms, so these platforms should be governed by their users. Um, this is my normative stance to make it clear. There's another question here in the front from the gentleman, and I maybe you already got the greatest response. To I ordered the book just now. You know? <laughs> Can't get better than this. Uh, yeah, thanks for the talk. It was really interesting. Um, I was wondering, do you differentiate between like the differences between um, you know, these kind of if-then kind of algorithms, um, and then the ones that are based on machine learning? Because you know, mm. if-then kinds of alg algorithms, it's much easier just to change the logic, and it's made much more transparent. But with machine learning, these uh, layers of new, uh, neural networks and things, um, it's not really possible just to intervene and to say because because nobody can look at a, new, a neural network and say, this causes this, so I'm just going to change this little node within the network. Um, how do you differentiate between the two? So in principles, you're perfectly right. And when I said that keeping rules secret and changing to avoid resistance is one reason, the other reason is, of course, that they are often too complicated to present to users. But in reality, these models are very rarely exist in their you know, pure forms. So in most systems, 
that we know um, they are uh, comprised of both um, if-then rules uh, formulated by engineers who know what they are doing but, and, and by machine learning, even when they are, it's mostly machine learning, people tweak with them and people try to uh, explore their uh, people, I mean, people who work in these corporations, the effects of different tweaks. So it's not that they are completely uh, without influence over, over, over the, the results. And being able, you know, being, having the potential power to tweak, to change, to tr play with these, with, these, uh, with these systems gives them power. But you are completely right that these are different models in a sense. Thank you. So are there any other questions or comments? If not, then I would like to say thank you so much for this talk and discussion uh, this evening. It was wonderful, and I really enjoyed reading your book and having you here. And then I'd say um, to everyone, have a nice evening. Nice that you were here. See you next time, and bye-bye. Uh, thank you for having me. Really, really enjoyed reading your book. It was really, 